Becky Hawkins is a hospice nurse and a chaplain. She is the author of Transitions, a nurse's education about life and death. She sat beside the bedside of seriously ill and terminally, terminally ill patients for more than 30 years as an oncology and hospice nurse. During that time, she listened to patients describe various kinds of spiritual experiences, including their death experiences. Becky will be sharing these stories, including the lessons she learned from them tonight. So please welcome Becky. <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, it's such a gift. Um, when he was talking earlier about how, you know, how did you find us, you know, and how did you connect? Uh, it just reminds you that there's so much more going on that, than meets the eye uh, about how these um, supposedly coincidences happen. Um, actually, I think there's much more behind that. Um, let me just share with you a little bit about me. I do want to thank David for this opportunity to be here. Um, I did email him and just happened to say, I thought maybe I could just meet him while I was here in Sedona visiting my precious friend Dorothy. And, and he sent an email right back and said, could you speak? So this is just another one of those things that I just worked out and I'm just really tickled to be here and be with you. My first exposure to nursing was when I was 19 years old looking for a job six weeks after the birth of our daughter. The only job available in the newspaper ads was as a nurse's aide in a nursing home. Why not, I thought. Let's go try it. <coughs> it was the hardest, least paying job I've ever had in my life. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with those patients and the stories that they were sharing with me. And it was my first exposure to seeing people die. That was when and where I decided that I wanted to go to nursing school someday. Didn't have any money. It took me seven years before I could get to go to nursing school to become a registered nurse. I graduated in 1980 and my first job was at a big hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma on their brand new oncology ward. Again, I fell in love with the patients and their families. It was very, very hard work and I couldn't believe at first I was getting paid, but that wore off. <laughs> Over the years, I worked with oncology patients, outpatient oncology, hospice, home health hospice. I took two years of training and became a hospice chaplain and a hospice volunteer. And now I'm retired and I just visit people. Early in my career, while I was working on that oncology ward one evening, I lost three patients. When I got home, I was trying to tell my husband about it. There were so many emotions that I was trying to deal with. I didn't know quite what to do. He said, you know, why don't you write that down? Because I don't think I want to hear all that stuff. He said, and maybe it'll help you with your emotions. He said, you know, just write that down. So early <clears throat> on, I started writing. I visited our local newspaper office, talked to the editor, and said, what do you think? Could someone else use some of this information? And he goes, yeah. He said, can you write one every week? And I said, sure. My first article was in May of 1986, and I write one every week to this day. Now I have 30 years of these memories in my office at home. So I turned 60 last year and my husband said, you know, maybe you ought to write a book before you forget how to do that. He's always good for ideas. <clears throat> and I said, well, I don't know how a person could go to a Tom Bird seminar and write a book in five days. And he said, you're not going to know till you go and find out. And I did. I wrote my book in five days because what he told us was bring it up from your heart, not just from your head and it will come, and you can birth that book. Dying people can teach us so much about life. What we have to do is be present to them and listen to them and hear their stories and the stories of those who have near-death experiences. Perhaps some of you can even relate to that.
I was fascinated with the near-death experience stories of those first books that David was talking about when they were coming out by Dr. Raymond Moody, Dan M. Brinkley, Betty Eady, and I can remember reading them without stopping. I could not put it down. I wanted to keep reading and keep reading and hear more and more. Why? These stories and those books gave me new hope and added hope to my faith because I had been at so many bedsides <clears throat> where sometimes some of these people did not have hope and were very, very frightened about the thought of dying. Where was I escorting them to? Because I have shared with many people that I feel like a midwife to the other side. I'm not pushing, I'm not forcing, but being present to them in that process. And I count it a huge honor because it's the holiest ground I've ever stood on, being with these people. And just like David mentioned earlier too, they come from all backgrounds, all faiths. Some were Amish, some were Catholic, some were agnostic, some were Baptist. And as I say in my book, where was I helping them go to, really? When working with those in the nursing home in 1971, I was 19, uneducated, inexperienced, and horrified each time I lost a patient and would cry. They would find me in the mop closet. Becky, you can come out now. And I got to the point, though, that I didn't run from death anymore, but I ran toward it. When I was working in a psychiatric ward as a nurse's student seven years later, I took care of a gentleman one day who was diagnosed as manic depressive back then. <clears throat> he had lung cancer, and he was scheduled to have surgery the next day to see if they could remove some of the tumors. He was wild. He was so funny. He looked like Willie Nelson. He had long hair, pulled back, thin, rough, tough looking, and ranting and raving, and running up and down the hallway screaming, praise God, glory be to God, I'm going to heaven tomorrow. Give Oral Roberts all your money. And just back and forth, all, he was just all over the place, just carrying on, and they said, we want you to go um, trim his toenails. I said, what? <laughs> I don't even know if I can catch his toes. <laughs> they said, well, we want you to go in there because he needs to have that done before he goes to surgery. I said, you know, I'm getting ready to graduate from nursing school, you want me to go trim somebody's toenails? And they said, yeah, we do. Well, you learn a lot when you learn to be humble. So I talked the little fella into calming down just a little bit, got him in the chair, got this stuff that I needed, sudged up his feet. He's still ranting and raving. He's still praising God and wanting everybody to give their money to Oral Roberts. And I'm soaping him up, soaping him up. You know, this was the old days, the long wards where the beds were lined up. VA hospital, different ones, different diagnosis. I'm taking care of him, and in walks one of his buddies, who is a paranoid schizophrenic. And my patient says to him, hey, where have you been, what have you been doing, what are you going, what, what's going on, what's happening? They don't want you to ask them that stuff. <laughs> and so he walks over to my patient, hits him right between the eyes, right here. <laughs> it wasn't funny, but at the time, blood is going everywhere. I got under the first bed I could find. And I started screaming, help, you know, for the orderlies to come and get me and come and rescue me. Because I thought, you know, I'm going to die here trying to trim somebody's toenails. This isn't pretty. This isn't what I was planning on. Well, my little patient is screaming too. He's carrying, carrying on, carrying on, you know, and just and screaming for help. And the orderlies <laughs> come in and they get the poor little confused guy and take him off. And, and uh, my patient's sitting there and he goes, well, Thanks be to God. The little nurse was screaming and saved my life. Glory be to God. Give all your money to Oral Roberts. <laughs> so my supervisor walks in and she goes, Becky, you can come out now. So I crawled out from under the bed and sat with my patient and visited with him some more. When I got back to the hospital room where uh, we were having our, our little nurse's meeting, uh, my supervisor said to me, 
did you learn anything today? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. She said, okay. I said, can I go early tomorrow morning and pray with him before he has surgery? I think he's kind of into prayer. And she said, uh, yes, get permission and you can go. So I went and he'd had his medication and he was calmed down a little bit. And I said a prayer with him and went to do my work and came back after his surgery to go to ICU and check on him. I couldn't find him. And so I went to the nurse's desk and I told them who I was looking for. And they said, sweetheart, he died in surgery. He wasn't crazy. He knew what he was hearing. One evening at a fundraiser dinner in our local community, a very kind lady pulled me aside and said, say, Becky, you know, I've been reading your stories in the newspaper, and uh, you had one about a near-death experience the other day, and I had one when I was four years old. Um, will you call me so we can get together and talk about it? So I did, and I went to her home and visited with her. We sat down at her kitchen <coughs> table, beautiful woman in her 70s, very strong, very positive, very precious. She said, well, you know, I was four years old and I had polio. I was in the hospital in the children's ward, hospital in Tulsa. There again, many, many, many years ago, the beds were lined up. She said there were little white metal beds lined up. She said, I was in so much pain. I didn't think I could stand it. And her father was at her bedside with her and she saw the nuns and watched them going up and down the hallways to take care of the children. She was in such terrible pain, and all of a sudden she said she was out of her little body and racing above it, and watching her dad try to, you know, get her going again. He was, he was concerned, he could tell. She wasn't breathing anymore. And she said, Becky, I was in the most beautiful place. She said it was all light and it was bright, and I was surrounded as like it was a cocoon of warmth, and I was um, not hurting anymore. There was no more pain. And she said, I saw the nuns come from the other end of the hall, rushing towards my body. She said, I was filled with such indescribable love. I cannot find a word to tell you what it was like. There was so much peace, but I could see my father's anguish at the thought of losing me, and all of a sudden I was back in my body with all the horrible pain, and I tried to tell him, Dad, I died. And he said, shh, don't tell anyone that. That was just a dream. Years and years later, when these first books started coming out, she read them. And she said, at that point I knew it was not a dream, just as I had thought it was real. When I was working in hospice, a spouse of one of my patients called our office to ask that I come over right away. He was a very precious elderly man, white shock of hair, a little Pentecostal minister. His wife was his second wife. The first one had passed years before, and this wife had been one of his parishioners. And she felt like it was improper to call him by his name, uh, first name. So she called him Brother Talbert. So Brother Talbert was um, sitting in a blue recliner, and he was bluer than his recliner when I got there. She did not do well with this whole scenario. She, her safety net was pulling her apron up and running to the kitchen, and that's exactly what she did. She ran back in there. He said, she'll be okay. But she said, he said, can you get me to my bed? And I said, yes. And I literally picked the little fella up, and I carried him to his bed, hospital bed, that was there in the living room by a big picture window, and outside of that was what he liked to look at, his parsonage, there's, you know, the church, I mean, and then the tree that was about, oh, two or three hundred years old out there. He loved those things very much. So I straddled him. I got in behind him, and I had him sitting straight up. He was agonal, and his breathing was very labored and very short. He could not get air. So he felt better if I held him up very straight, 
and I had my fingertips on his shoulders, and he patted me. And he said, Becky, do you see them? And I said, no, but tell me what you're seeing, because I'd had too many people tell me. He said, sweetheart, the room is full of angels now. He said, they're all over. They're over here on this side, and they're over here on this side. He said, they're all over. He said, Annie, I have to go. I love you. I'll see you again. And he held up his right arm, and he said, my Lord. And he fell back against me on my chest. This man was on no pain medicine. It was his heart and his lungs that were damaged from chemo and radiation in the 70s, which was caustic, even more so than now. That's what he was dying from. Was he hallucinating? Not in my books. I believe that man. He gave me another new hope that made me understand how indeed holy that ground is when we are with those loved ones that are transitioning and that veil is parted. One day I was assigned to go see a lady who had been admitted into our hospice program after leaving ICU. She was another cutie. She lived in a house that had red shutters and pink painted on the trim and there was flowers, pink and red flowers, uh, going up the sidewalk to the house. She, um, when I found her inside there, she was sitting in a, a rocker that was pink flowered covered. And uh, she had a lot of things surrounding her. But before we could do any paperwork or anything, she said, now listen here, we got to have a talk. She said, they brought me home from ICU and I've been at Heaven's Gate three times and they shocked the snot out of me all three times and brought me back. <laughs> She said, if you try to lay a hand on me when I start to pass, I promise you I'm going to haunt you when I do get to die. <laughs> she said, don't be doing that. She said, if I have to, I'm old, but I'll get DNR tattooed across my chest. I said, I said sweetheart, it's okay. I believe you. We're going to help you. We're going to assist you. We're not going to try to keep you here. She said, all right, then we can talk. But it was very important to her that no one tried to rescue her again. She said, you know, I'm 82 years old. My heart's failing. I'm not going to get a heart transplant, and it's okay to go. My husband went on ahead of me. I'm ready to go. Let me go. She said, you wouldn't believe the music I was hearing. You wouldn't believe the light. You wouldn't believe the love and the peace. She said, don't, don't do that to me. And I said, we won't. She said, okay, now let's talk about what we will do today. She said, while I'm sitting here, she had a full bodice apron on. Guess what color it was? <laughs> Pink. And she was going through boxes of stuff, and she was labeling some beautiful china, some depression glass, Roseville pottery, all this stuff, putting her nieces and nephews' names on it. She said, you know, it's a shame on this earth how we put stuff away in a china cabinet. We don't ever get it out and use it. She said, what are we waiting on? Here I am, and it's time to go, and I'm getting it out of the cabinet to give to somebody else. She said, the thing is, most of our stuff that we've got is either going to end up in a garage sale or an auction. We're not taking it with us. And I had one lady tell me that. She said, I've been down to that funeral home making my arrangements, and she said, I want to tell you, I looked at those coffins, and they don't have any luggage racks. <laughs> she said, you know, we need to just be about using our stuff and enjoying our day. So I sat with her and I tried to listen to what she wanted to say. It was important to her. It's important for people that we hear them and know that their lives mattered and that they um, can say what they need to say. And that's what she wanted me to know. It was a joy. I had decided when I was going to go back the next day that I was going to cut some of those pretty pink and red flowers and put in one of those beautiful vases for her as she continued to go th through stuff. But her neighbor met me at the door when I got there. She had died during the night in her chair. And I was happy for her that nobody tried to bring her back anymore, mm -hmm. that she was able to move forward. About two years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine I've known just about all of my life. He was dying and he wanted to chat. 
He talked about his army days, and he had um, these wonderful albums full of pictures from those army days. His career, he was a sign uh, creator, neon signs, and he was so good at it. He did such a good job. His family, and then he turned to me, and he said, you know, Becky, I am not afraid to die. Anytime anybody says that to me, I'm curious to know why. I said, really? Why? How come? I asked that in all sincerity. He said, well, because I've already done that. And I said, oh, you have? I said, let me hear your story. He said, last year I was having a terrible pain in my gut. He said it was bad, and I told my wife, I said, we got to get to the hospital. Let's go. Let's get the car. Let's go. And he said, we got in there, and they were working on me and working on me, and it got, things got serious. And uh, I could tell that there was quite a bit of urgency, and I was deciding that I was going to try not to worry about it. All of a sudden, he said, I was out of my body, and I was sliding down this beautiful slide, and all of this beautiful blue watery-like stuff was around me, swirling around. And he said it was peaceful, didn't have the pain in my gut anymore. He said it was just wonderful. And I was just feeling all of this uh, love and this peace and this joy and everything. And he said, I heard my wife's voice. Honey, please don't leave me yet. Please. He said, I turned myself over and I grabbed a hold and I pulled myself back up, and there I was, back in that ER, and they were working on me again. He said, don't you think that's strange? I would never did really leave that ER, did I? And all that noise that was going on, all that commotion that was going on around me, and all I heard was my wife's voice. I want to read a story to you out of my book, one of them about a little fellow that was a real treat. The title of this is called Feeling Like a Million Bucks. It was so hot that summer that grasshoppers were committing suicide, throwing themselves onto the blistering pavement and looking like their own version of popcorn shrimp. I loaded my car with sweat running down my back. Gross. I was trying to remember all that Larry needed. Blue pads for the bed, Foley catheter, draw sheets, anything that he needed to help make him more comfortable, patches for a bed sore that was starting to appear on his tailbone. And walking from my car to his front steps, I heard the sound of crunching gravel. But there was no gravel, it was the grass. So very dry. I let myself inside and hollered my arrival. Larry, it's me, I'm back. He said, come on, come on in here, sis. Come in here and sit down. Put all that stuff down on that card table my daughter brought me over here yesterday. She was tired of trying to balance everything on that top of that chest of drawers. And I'm feeling like a million bucks. Sis, I tell you what, you check my blood pressure and I bet it's perfect. I, however, was eyeballing his urine drainage bag. It was dark red. Now, sis, I see you peering around to see my pee bag, but not to worry, my dear. I'm telling you, I really feel great. <coughs> I started digging out the blood pressure cuff to see if his blood pressure was probably rapidly falling and put his cold, bony, black and blue hand, he did, on my forearm, and he said, would you please, would you please just stop here just a minute and sit down? I'm trying to talk to you. What is it? What are you trying to say, Larry? I earnestly ask, while putting everything down, sitting in the metal folding chair that a neighbor had brought by. He started smiling from ear to ear. Wait till I tell you this. He said, my mother came to see me last night. I said, she did. I said, how old is she? You're 80 something. He said, she's been dead for 10 years. He said, she came. And she said, Sonny boy, I'm going to help you. You're going to be dying before long, and I don't want you to be afraid. I'm going to be right here. I'm going to help you cross over, so you don't have to worry about that. And he was pointing to the corner of the room where he had seen her. Then what? I asked, getting even closer to him, not wanting to miss a word. 
Well, there were two white figures on either side of her. I said, were they angels? And he goes, well, I don't know. They didn't have wings, but they was white. He said, they were with her. They were nice looking, though. He was a mess. He said, I asked her, Mother, am I dying now? No, sonny boy, not yet, but soon, and I'll be with you. He said, you know, that light began to fade a little bit then, and she was gone. They were all gone. But I tell you what, he said, I believe with all my heart that she'll be here. And he, sees, he said, see, see, that's why I feel like a million bucks today. He said, it doesn't matter what you see in that bag. And it doesn't matter what my blood pressure is anymore. It's okay. Why don't you put your nurse's bag down and just sit with me for a little bit? He said, I think I'd like that. He said, I just wanted you to know. He said, but I prefer you don't tell anybody while I'm still alive, they'll think I'm crackers. He said, I don't want anyone coming in here and trying to tell me I was hallucinating. And you don't need to keep putting that salve on my elbows either. And, and you can carry all that other stuff back too. And then we both started laughing and grinning, little crying. And I called the next morning to get my assignments and my supervisor told me, Larry passed away last night. And you can't tell me that his mother wasn't right there with him. Sometimes when I'm able, I try to go with my sweet husband on one of his continuing education trips. A little over a year ago, he had one in Albuquerque. I like Albuquerque. And I stationed myself in the restaurant of a hotel to watch people. My good friend Dorothy can tell you, I like to talk to strangers. It's a great pastime activity. About 1.30 after all the lunch crowd had dispersed, an elegant lady came through the door of the restaurant. She was dressed with complimentary colors, looking all stylish and comfortable at the same time. Careful footing that she had with her cane that she could tell she was very familiar with. She eyed me out of the corner of her eye and she said, come over here and sit with me. She said, I don't like to eat lunch by myself. Come sit with me. Well, you know me, I jumped, I jumped up there so fast I could barely get myself together to go sit down there with her and visit with her a little while. You see, she had this voice that was kind of like Maya Angelou's. It was full and robust, and she just rolled these words around in our mouth. And I thought, you know, she's got a story in her. They were there for a nurse practitioner conference. Not only was she a nurse practitioner, but she was um, a professor in the college, teaching the nurse practitioners. I was in awe, just wanting to sit there and visit with her. But that's not what she wanted to talk about. What she wanted to talk about was me. She said, what are you doing? Who are you? What are you doing with your life? Get over to that page and share some of that with you. I told her about my career in hospice. Hospice she said, and she rolled the word around. Hmm, tell me, have they, in your experience, ever shared with you before what they were seeing as they were passing? Yes, some do. She put down her fork and she wiped her mouth with her white linen napkin. She said, you know, my sister, Many years ago, I had an experience. Her husband called me one night and said, something's wrong with Margaret. She's in bed and she keeps passing out. What should I do? He said, well, she said, well, call an ambulance. Call her doctor. And I met her at the ER and, the do and her husband said that the paramedics couldn't get the IV started in her arms, so they had to put it in her neck. And she said, I knew then there was some serious trouble going on. But in spite of nearly bleeding to death due to a ruptured tubal pregnancy, she survived. She said that with a look of, and you know what that means. It was weeks later when my sister and I were sitting at her kitchen table and I asked her point blank, Margaret, 
I was wondering about your ambulance ride. Do you remember anything? She said, yes. And she smiled. What do you see? She said. She leaned in and almost whispered as if she was telling a national security secret. Light. Such an amazing, warm, beautiful light. And I heard music like you've never heard on this earth. My new friend then sat up straight and she pointed her fork at me and she said, all this you see here right now, all around us, this is temporary. That's all it is. There's so much we can't even begin to conceive in our wildest imaginations. You know, we are just passing through here. Yes, ma'am. I know. I wanted to share with you some of my family's stories. I think that's one of the things that gets our attention the quickest because we can read these books and read these books and read these books, but until it happens to you or a loved one, sometimes you're doubtful. My husband's mother had a massive stroke in the early 80s. A friend of hers noticed at the convenience store that they owned when she arrived to open the front door early that morning that she wasn't speaking clearly and thought I should come and get her and take her to the hospital. When I arrived, I could tell that she was in distress and headed as fast as I could to the hospital. She did survive, although her blood pressure was like something like nearly 300 over 200. It was crazy high, but she did survive. <clears throat> She was able to live at home for a few years with occasional help from a home health agency and the family. But then she broke her arm and leg one day in the bathroom trying to maneuver and didn't do very well. We took her after her hospitalization to a nursing home and that's where she was for about 12 years. During that 12th year, after an exam by her doctor, due to her complaint of abdominal discomfort, she was scheduled for x-rays and then surgery because of a partial bowel obstruction. Even though she knew it was risky, she wanted to proceed. She said she didn't want to die and was afraid it might be cancer and she wanted to get rid of it. A couple of weeks after she returned to the nursing home, she called me wanting to talk to her son. She said, I need to talk to John. And I said, he's in Oklahoma City. Can I come? And she said, yes. So I went and I sat on the uh, arm of her chair. My daughter had named her Ninny when she was a little girl. And I said, Ninny, tell me, what is it that you need to say? She said, I died when I was in the hospital. I said, you did? I said, what did you see? She said, well, I was in that <coughs> surgery room and all of a sudden, I was up in the corner over here. And she said, I could hear them. And they were saying, we're losing her. We're losing her. And she said, I could see. She said, I didn't think they were losing me. I was right there. And she said, there was all these instruments. And they were all lined up. She said, I saw where all of the instruments were. She named everyone that was in that room. Small town, you know, all the doctors and nurses. She knew everybody that was in there. And then she started really smiling. And I said, what else did you see? She said, I saw my family. She said, honey, I'm not afraid to die anymore. It's okay. Two months later, we got a call that she was in respiratory distress. And we rushed to the hospital and into the emergency room. The nurse there said, we need to intubate her. She can't breathe good anymore. She raised up her hand and did like this and looked at me. Because I've been there forever, they know me well enough, and the doctor said, what do you want? I said, I want a private room and oxygen if we need it or want it, and I want the pain medicine if she needs it or wants it. I want the medication to help her not rattle so much if she needs it, and to be alone. And so we did. My husband and myself and um, his two sisters were there that night. 
The morning came and she was in a coma. And she slipped away quietly, peacefully, with a smile on her face. What a gift that she was given with that near-death experience just two months before. Because from the time she had had that stroke, 12 years, she was horrified of death. She wasn't afraid anymore. I'm going to share another one with you. When um, I was getting ready to come to Sedona to write my book last year, my husband and I were in Oklahoma City visiting his uncle, and his uncle's wife was dying with brain cancer. And the family welcomed us in, but then quietly and quickly ushered me to the side and they said, we know how you are, don't be talking to her about anything religious. And I said, I won't, I promise, I'll just visit with her. When we got in there, she recognized us and was able to say a few words, but you could tell, you know, their cancer was advanced. They told me that she was terrified. She was afraid that she hadn't been good enough to make it. So I leaned down, I broke my promise, and I whispered to her. And I said, do not be afraid, because your angels are going to be with you at that time. Perhaps even some loved ones will come. You will not die alone. You're just going to transition. It's OK. You're more than good enough. It's all right. On the way out here, I received the phone call. I drive out here. Um, that she had passed. I always visit this lovely friend of mine here in Sedona. Her name's Nirup. She um, is a medium, psychic person, and we just visit. And so I went in to see her one day while I was here. And she said, what do you want to talk about today? And I said, I don't know. How about the book? And she said, wait, wait. She goes, there's somebody that's jumping up and down, spiritual realm, all excited about seeing you, wanting to thank you, a female, white hair. She said, do you have any idea who that is? I said, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't know. I'm not sure. And she goes, no, 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 no. This is somebody that's just crossed over. And she said, you helped her cross over with no fear. She wants you to know that she wants you to tell the people at home, I made it. I was OK. I was good enough. So that was pretty precious to me. My brother, I don't have to read that. I can tell that to you. Four children, I'm the oldest, he was the youngest. And the last chapter in my book is called My Brother's Keeper. My brother was a tough guy, welder, been in AA 15 years. Uh, he'd been around, um, been nearly beat to death two or three times, been uh, wrecked two Harley Davidsons, uh, three vehicles, pulled out of the back uh, glass of a car that was burning one time. He had a telephone pole that came and just n nearly missed him one time. I just, just lived a wild life. But he and I were close. He moved home, uh, asked my dad if he could come and live with him, because my dad's wife had just passed with um, lung cancer. And went to work for a local uh, business doing welding. He did good for about a year. We met him in Walmart one day. He said, he said Becky, um, I, uh, I gotta go have a CAT scan. He said, uh, will, you, uh, will you go with me? And I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, well, I'm coughing up some blood and, and uh, having trouble moving one of my arms and you know something's not right. They thought it was pneumonia but I, I don't think it's pneumonia. I said okay. Well indeed I met him there. I said let's get this going. We'll get this checked out. He could barely speak because he was so, so afraid. And we did and they told us that yes it was bad and uh, that they would set up an appointment for us to see the oncologist. That would be 12, about 12 days away from them. One of those days uh, during that time, we went to my sister's birthday party. 
and um, came back and he was chilling hard. And I said, do you want to go to the hospital? And he said, no. He said, let me sit in dad's recliner, um, take some Advil, I'll be okay. If I need you, I'll call you. And no more got home than his name has shown up on my phone. And all I can hear is gasping, gasping, gasping. And I said, I'm on my way. I'm calling an ambulance, I'll be right there. And hung up called my dad, who was on the other end of the house, and I said, Daddy, get into Jeffrey. He can't breathe. Get him up. Hit him on the back. Shake him. Could be there's something, you know, occluding his uh, airway passages. When I got there, the ambulance was there. My brother was sitting in the recliner. They were getting ready to load him, and he was purple. He was barely getting any air at all. But they loaded him, they took him to the hospital. We went to Tulsa after that. We were there for 10 days and that's when we uh, started radiation and chemo. Tumor was wrapped around his aorta, into his lungs and was all over the place. They said, we cannot save your brother, but we can buy him some time. And my brother said, I want all the time you can give me. I want all the medicine you can give me, I wanna do it. I said, okay, let's go, we'll do it. I'll, I'll hang with you. We get back home after this hospitalization and every day with radiation you know you got to go every day and so I'm in the car driving him one day and he taps me on the shoulder I about died that night at the house I said well no kidding you were purple and he goes no no I about died and as soon as he said that I turned to him and I said what did you see he said he was choking, 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 and then all of a sudden he's up, and he's in this warm, beautiful place, and my mother, our mother is approaching him. She died in 2002, and she's on his left side. A friend who committed suicide a year before comes, and I was on the right side of him, a dear friend, and my brother knew what was happening, and he said, please, please, not yet. And my mother said, then breathe, son, breathe. Boom, there he is with the ambulance people. He said, what do you think about that? I said, what do you think? He said, I think they bought me some more time. I said, I think you're right. You see, what was so huge with that was that he and my mother were so very, very close. She was closest to him. So that was huge, getting to see her. But the other thing was, we were told when we were little kids, if you committed suicide, you went to hell. Well, number one, I don't believe in hell as what we were taught as a child anymore. And number two, it gave my brother the realize, realization that his friend did not go to a horrible place. Because that was one of the reasons why my brother was so concerned about dying. Am I good enough? I've lived, I've lived a rough life. Who will take me in? Who will speak for me? And he had peace. He died a year later. What have I learned from these patients? A lot. I wish... Um, we had several hours to tell you, but I'm going to um, <clears throat> just tell you a few things briefly. I want you to know that I am not afraid of dying at all, not one bit. I've been at so many bedsides, I can't begin to tell you the number. And I am not afraid. I believe that we are beautiful spiritual beings who are here for a very, very brief time in these clay vessels to learn lessons for our souls and to learn how to love one another better, to learn how to treat each other the way that God wants us to treat each other. And then I think we move forward. I believe that we are here with great purpose and on purpose. Do not think for a minute that you're an accident and you were born to who you were born to, and you were with the people that you are with now as a great divine plan. We learn from our families a lot sometimes that we don't want to learn, but they are teaching us 
as hopefully we are teaching them. I believe we're here to take care of the earth too and all the animals, the plants, everything. And when we do that, my patients te teach me that it's not about getting an award. It's not about getting a pat on the back or applause. It's because it's our duty and a really wonderful opportunity. You see, all those who tell me of their near-death experiences say they want to contribute in any way to make a difference in whatever their life has left for them here, in whatever little town they live in, whatever community, whatever business they're doing. And they love sharing their story, and they don't care whether you believe them or not. That does not matter to them. That's not a big deal to them. It doesn't matter because they're safe in their stories. They love their stories and it's all good for them. And I never tire of hearing another one. When someone approaches me and asks me, do you believe that we have many lives? I don't know. I can't tell you that for sure. It makes a lot of sense. I don't think I can learn everything in one lifetime. But if you do, I think the most important life that we're to be concentrating on is this life, this journey, this day, this time. This is what we're supposed to be about. I was taking care of a sweet cowboy patient one time in the oncology ward. He didn't say a whole lot, but when he did talk, I paid attention. I was getting the supplies ready to give him his chemo. He said, Becky, I want you to put that stuff down there for a minute. I want to talk to you a bit. I said, well, what's going on? Well, I know you're going to give me that medicine. It's going to make me drowsy, and I want to share something with you. I said, what do you want to share with me? He said, well, I've been thinking. You know, they told me they got to this quick enough, they think, and I'm going to be all right. He said, but you know, when you hear the word cancer, you start thinking. What if this is it? He said, you know, about the only good words my neighbor ever hears out of me is a cussing me, I'm cussing my cows. You know, I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing. That's about all he hears out of me. My wife, God bless her soul, I'm no help to her. I don't help her in that kitchen and she does stuff all the time. And my poor little kids, they're good little kids, but all they hear out of me is, did you help your mother get that feed out of the trunk of the car? Did you do your homework? Did you close that gate so those steers don't get out? You know, I don't ever say much nice to them at all. And he said, every time I see my mother-in-law pull up in the driveway, yeah, I hightail it to that back bedroom as fast as I can and shut that door. He said, she's not a bad sort, but I don't want to visit with her. He said, I go to the church and I sit on the back pew and I give them $2, but as soon as I think that minister's about done, I get out of there. He said, you know, they're not a bad sort. He said, but they kind of like to talk out of both sides of their mouths. He said, you know, they kind of can be ornery. I said, well, I can't imagine that, you know, that you've done anything wrong. He said, well, of course, you're not going to say anything, and I'm not going to say anything to you. He said, you guys got the needles. He said, but here's the deal. <coughs> I went to a service the other day, and he said, Becky, there was standing room only for this fella. He said he had a dairy farm out west of town. He said he was always doing something for somebody. Everybody in the community knew how he stood about his, with his family and his work and his church and everything. He was always doing for somebody else. And he told his kids before he died, don't let anybody stand and brag on me because I think that crosses out anything I've done good. Just preach about love. Don't be preaching about me. He said, you know that minister couldn't even hardly find time to get up there and talk because everybody lined up because they wanted to testify what this man had done for them. He was giving them corn out of his garden, giving them milk or cream or eggs. Or he's stopping along the side of the road to help somebody with a flat. He said, I just sat there on that back pew and I thought, who would stand up for me? He said, that man was making some of the finest golden footprints I've ever imagined on the face of the earth. He said, it's made me rethink this whole process. And I think I'm going to go visit my neighbor. And I'm going to go tell him how much it meant to me. He chopped the ice on my paw this last winter when I was so weak from all the chemo and radiation. I couldn't swing an axe. And he never said anything about it. He just did it. 
I'm going to tell my kids how much I appreciate them. He said, they're good kids. I want them to have good memories of me talking to them about how I love them. I'm going to tell my wife how much I appreciate all she does. And I'm going to quit eating dinner in front of the TV with my Roy Rogers TV tray. And I'm going to come in there and sit at the table with them. Spend time with them. He said, I do have to be honest with you and tell you, I might not be as quick and as good about my mother-in-law. <laughs> he said, but I'll try. He said, you know, she's not really a bad sort either. I'm going to try to hang out with her a little bit more. He said, I... I think it's really important that I give that church five dollars instead of two. And he said, I might let that minister shake my hand. He's not a bad guy either. He said, you know, church isn't for perfect people. He said, you know, in the same pew there might be somebody that's a cussing person and somebody might be a snob. He said, I think that church is for everybody. I said, well, I want to tell you this. You, my friend, have left golden footprints here today. There wasn't a dry eye in my recliners where these people were lined up getting their chemo. Because you see, each one of those people heard him and it touched them and it made a difference. He was saying things that a sermon would give to other people. I put the band-aid on his hand after taking his IV out. He put his sweat-stained cowboy hat on and he nodded to each one as he left without saying a word. And he shuffled off in his cowboy boots to the elevator and he left. You are all precious and beloved. Don't ever forget that. And everything that you do does matter to somebody else. Find out whatever it is that you do well and do it. Give to the world, give to your neighbors, give to others because you have it within you. Everybody does. That special talent, that special gift. I can't cook. I can barely boil water. But I got two sisters that can cook like you would, you can't imagine. And one of them's always baking bread, zucchini bread or something and taking it to somebody. She doesn't want to pat on the back. She often doesn't even let them know who did it. She's always doing something for somebody else. And the other sister too, same way. Friends that I know that spend all of their time rescuing animals, doing something for some little animal that somebody's dropped off the side of the road. And other people doing other, I love it when people are into recycling. You know, I loved it when I come in here to this church tonight and saw the containers back there. People that care about the earth. People that are brilliant, they can help little kids in school because maybe somebody at home is too tired, too depressed to read to them. Our children need us. Our elderly need us. There's only a few people that are brave enough to go into a nursing home and sit with someone and just be present to them. I don't know what your gift is, but I know that you've got one. This is what I would share with you. Be you. What I want to share with people in this book, don't be afraid to be your authentic self. I'm pretty goofy and people like me pretty well. Just be yourself. And then don't be afraid when it's time to transition because that's all you're doing. You're just moving from one area to another. And it's a very, very beautiful, holy time. Now, questions, answers. Anybody want to remark on anything? Yes. I can't hear very well, so speak up. Uh, my name is China. I also work in hospice, and I'm very privileged I have a chance to sit with a lot of patients. Yes. So by listening to what you say, I'm also teaching classes at Deaf and Dying also. Yes. In the Yapapai College right now. Good. So it's really inspiring because I'm also doing research on this topic. But I don't know how can I convey that security like to comfort them. They're dying. I think the very most important thing that we do at the bedside, what I've learned from many years of this, is just being present to them and asking them, tell me what you're afraid of. Because some people are afraid that they're not good enough and then you want to. A good hospice team has a chaplain, has a social worker, has volunteers, has all kinds of people. And a good hospice team should be able to come in and help work together because, you know, what are their fears? Are they afraid of um, 
going to hell? Because some people are afraid of that. Are they afraid that you're not going to be able to alleviate their suffering? You know, there's no reason for anybody to have pain that's not addressed. None. There's plenty of medicine. Don't let any loved one that any of you all have go through that. That's, it's, it's, it's a shame, a tragedy, that anyone should go through that. So I find out what they're afraid of, and I gently address it if they are willing to share with me to try to help them work through that, through that hospice team, to find out what are you afraid of, and then comfort them. Sometimes the most important thing is for them to know that their life has mattered and that they will not be alone, mm -hmm. that somebody will be with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then most of them have dementia? They yes. Only, yeah. Only yes. that I can do just there and hold their hands. Yes, because this is another thing that's very, very important. You see, your spirit hears. You can get this from this book, you know, like Anita Marjani's where she was in a coma and her organs were failing. I mean, she was going fast. She saw her brother get on a plane in India, saw him get on the plane to head her way, heard the doctors that were out in the hallway, that were uh, the doorway divided where no one could have heard. She knew everything that they had said. And what I always tell my families is hearing is the last sense to go. When the people are, you know, in a deep coma and you think, what am I going to say now? It's too late. No, it's not. Even if they have just passed and someone says to you, I'm so sorry, they're gone, they're probably still hanging out there waiting on you. The spirit, the spirit stays for a while. But these people with dementia, what I would say is keep talking to them because the real them hears you and can, can convey that message to that person in a place where we can't even see or understand. So I tell people that, Mother, I love you. I'm here for you. I will stay with you. Let me share a story with you about what you did for me when I was six years old. I'll never forget that. Thank you. Those are the types of things I try to tell people to do and share. Please, what else? Oh. No, no, Becky, uh, repeat the questions if you can. Pardon me? Repeat the questions. Okay, I'm so sorry. She was <laughs> at, thank you. She was asking about how to comfort some of these people <laughs> as they're passing and they're, you know, troubled, uh, fearful, or whatever. And this is what I would encourage anybody to do, what I was talking about. Anything else? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> well, since that now you know um, the whole thing about your death experience and you're not afraid of death, how would you see would change our medical decision to the end of life care? How would I see what? How would you see uh, the whole medical uh, decision at the end of life care? I mean, since that you have this knowledge about yes. not to be afraid of dying. I'm asked a lot of questions along that line. She was asking like how, how this would change uh, end of life care. Um, there's a lot to be said because people ask me, do I believe in euthanasia? Um, I can't do that, but I never tell anyone that's thinking about that that they are wrong because what we need to understand people is this is your life and this is your death. And we should always be able to choose how we want things to happen. Because sometimes people are trying to explain to a family member, I don't want any more chemo. I don't want another kidney transplant. I don't want you to put another valve in my heart. I'm ready to go. You need to let me go. And have to fight with the system, fight with the system, fight with the system to get them to understand. I had one lady that pulled her feeding tube out three times. And her daughter would call me and come put it back. And I said, okay, we need to have a talk. She doesn't want the feeding tube in there anymore. Well, she'll starve to death. I said, no, the cancer's killing her. You're feeding the tumor. It's okay. And of course, the doctor had to come and tell her all that so she could hear it and feel okay about it. But there's, the, the end of life care is uh, something that needs to be addressed uh, all over again. And guess who's gonna make the difference? We, we are the ones, all of us need to speak up and let uh, you know, everybody know how we're going to do this. Yes, sir. I was wondering, um, so when people die, there's like sometimes two different scenarios. One is 
they have their whole family and friends around and they're kind of sharing in the experience and supporting the person in their transition. It seems really wonderful to have a community of people there as one's dying. And then you have people that die when no one's around. It's like they wait until people leave the room to die. Can you say something about that? What do you, did you, did everybody hear his question, what he was talking about, how some people have, you know, all the, you know, siblings there and all the, everybody there, and it's a kind of like a, a real nice little um, movie scene, you know, where it's real peaceful and they die. It doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes there's siblings that are fussing over, you know, Fred's out there in the hallway, why won't he come in here and sit with the rest of us instead of staying out there? This is a huge matter I like to uh, address with families and visit with them. Fred, especially at the home, Fred may be one that can mow the yard. He's not good at the bedside. Betty may be really good at the bedside. Mother's love is the same for both of these people. Don't be putting a guilt complex on Fred if he's more comfortable mowing the yard. Jane Ann may be comfortable doing the books, you know, keeping up with the uh, accounting and all this other stuff, and she doesn't want to get anywhere near that bedside. She loves her mother dearly, but she doesn't want to do that. We need to not judge anyone where they are. Accept people as they are where they are and understand that that's not our deal. This is our deal. We're to take care of ourselves and what we're doing, how we're standing beside the bed and not try to say, you, you're hurting mother. You're breaking her heart. You have no idea. There's, there's been instances where people have spoken of a brother that's at home and mother in spirit goes and visits him before she dies. Sees him and he sees her. And also, what really broke my heart once in, uh, on the oncology floor, I don't know, I had probably 10 or 12 patients running, giving blood to somebody, packed red blood cells, platelets, whatever, and then a high potent antibiotics because of somebody's white counts being so low, introducing someone to chemotherapy for the very first time, and three people dying. You can't be in every room but I'm just trying, trying, trying my best to do all of this. And I go in to visit this one lady. No one is with her. And she was so sweet and so precious. I said, I'm so sorry that I'm not able to sit with you. And she said, Becky, those other people need you. I'm fine. I'm really fine. So I would run out and do some more, do some more, do some more, go back in. She said, you need to quit worrying about me. I'm not alone. <laughs> okay. She said, it's okay, sweetheart. I've got people here. I ran out, did some more, did some more, and came back in. And she was gone. Ah. Oh, broke my heart. But then as I got older, I began to understand that she wasn't alone. That there really was somebody with her. Yes. The scene at home where um, there's um, dissension, there's people sometimes fighting over possessions before a person takes their last breath. There's all kinds of scenarios. <coughs> but this is planet Earth. We're here learning lessons, and these types of things happen. And you just have to understand. Try to observe it without judging anybody where they are, and just you know, do your deal the best that you can to be present to someone else. That was a good one. Yes, sir. What is an estimated uh, percentage of those who have a negative experience? And, and I'm asking you to speculate now, but is it possible that fear is driving that negative experience? And are there things that hospice workers can do to alleviate that and maybe prevent that negative experience? That's, and that spoke to her uh, question earlier. Did you all hear his question where he's wanting to talk about, you know, some the, what's the percentage? David can speak to the percentage better than I can. One in five is the best estimate we have right now. 25%. One in, yeah, one in five people have some kind of distressing mm -hmm. near-death experience. It's not, it's a very small, very, very small percentage mm -hmm. that actually have full-blown hellish experiences, but some are, are afraid of the darkness, for instance, mm -hmm. or yes. something else. Some, mm -hmm. Anxiety, one in five is our best estimate right now. And yes, what you're saying is a lot of that is uh, driven by fear. 
And what I was speaking to her about is trying to find out what these fears are. Because if it is something along the line where they have had this doctrination of that, you know, there's a vengeful God waiting for them and he's got these books and all of this stuff is in there and they've, they're afraid they've done not enough good, then, you know, that's, that's, that's a really heartbreaking thing for somebody to be afraid to die because they think they're not going to be good enough. So you want to get somebody in there to visit with them and help them to understand, you know, you can let go of that one. You can let go of that fear. Please. You're, you're so good. You're, you're fine. It's okay. You know, to readdress. And I hope we as a society will begin to understand that too.